Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Tim Antonio from Neon One. Uh, we're going to give it another minute before we dive into today's presentation. We are sharing our webcams. We got a very short uh, set of deck deck slides for you. Uh, primarily, this is going to be an organic discussion, unpacking um, our uh, our you know maintaining culture and community leadership in a time of crisis. That that you know that's just a small topic that we, I guess just we can that. just that just that. Um, uh, want to appreciate everybody for making the time today. I think that's that's one of the things that um, it was interesting. We, I was just getting off a call with with our, our leadership here at Neon One talking about some some things that are, um, you know, happening in the industry. And uh, one of our, our general managers of the Neon CRM product said, it's interesting, we're talking to clients and um, and and people either are like, I need something right now and I don't just give me something or other people are like, you know what? I got time. Let's do this like really intensive data project, you know, and because I got nothing going on right now because our operations are shut down. So it uh, kind of depends. Um, Maddie. You look amazing, Maddie. Yes. Yeah. You, you, you Is look it all like, weird? Yeah. Welcome to my internet. It's like you're smoking. Or, I mean, okay. smoking. <laughs> it, it, no, house. it's it's kind of like uh, uh, one of those things, like the old Insider, that show, like uh, what was the show, like Hard Copy or whatever, where it's like they're gonna blur out the face, and and uh, <laughs> there you go, awesome. Don't worry about it, Maddie. We we understand anyway, uh, folks. We wanted to welcome you to today's presentation. We're gonna go ahead and, and just kind of pop into this. Um, we're going to be talking with uh, some really amazing thought leaders on on an important topic relating to what's happening to all of us right now. If you're anything like like me or or, or probably everybody who I've been talking to, it, it's a really weird time. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of um, probably weird rash emails that you might be getting telling you to do things that seem like a bad idea. Um, and then it's also you trying to figure out what exactly is a bad idea. Um, <laughs> those are important things. So uh, yes, there there will be a recording, by the way. So let's actually uh, pop into today's uh, webinar housekeeping for what we're doing. Um, this is this is being recorded. Um, we're uh, going to put it up in in uh, either our YouTube channel or we have some other hosting capabilities. So there'll be a place for for you to review this. Um, and uh, we're going to follow up. We actually have some resources. I, I uh, am going to point to the handouts section of GoToWebinar here because we actually took this deck uh, and put it in uh, into a PDF format that you can download. The big reason is that there's some amazing resources that are uh, two presenters put together. We're going to get into introductions very shortly, but just wanted to talk a little bit about um, uh, who's putting this on today. Uh, this is part of uh, Neon One. Uh, we've actually just launched a campaign, hashtag MPOs Rise, um, R-I-S-E. And so uh, kind of this is our response to COVID-19 in terms of trying to, to wade through the confusion uh, and, and set us up for success uh, because we can get through this. Um, and what we're trying to do as an industry leader is, is to kind of just curate key resources i think i've seen some even some articles about like there's just so much out there right what do i focus on and and so we'll get into that in a practical way from a leadership standpoint today but but the neon one ecosystem is comprised of a few key soft pieces of software uh, that help people raise money um, so neon crm rallybound uh, our giving day platform civicor and and arts people uh, for for ticketing, these are all things that that thousands of organizations are using. But uh, the the reason that I'm personally excited about today is that Neon One's approach is to build a a bigger uh, thing than just our technology, and and so that's going out to thought leaders and curating um, experiences, curating uh, content and and resources uh, from the best people out there to help you. And so our our uh, consultant network is very deep, um, but uh, it's it's. I'm so excited to have our two presenters here today, um, Maddie Grant and Mark Pittman. Um, so, uh, Maddie, I'm going to start with you because even though you're having some internet issues, we can definitely hear you. So, why don't you do a little bit of an introduction of who you are uh, and and why uh, you know 
why you think you're you're going to be able to address this topic in particular. <laughs> yes, thank you. And I do apologize about my video. Um, I actually called in to the webinar knowing that this might happen. It's been happening all week. Um, and of course, it was fine like 10 minutes ago, <laughs> but there you go. So um, yes, I'm Maddie Grant. Um, I am a culture designer. Um, I have specific expertise in digital transformation. So what that means is really culture change, um, originally starting with um, social media and that, how that basically changed how we work um, and how we lead and manage our organizations um, for the last decade. Um, but of course, more recently, culture change has been accelerated because of generational differences in the workplace. Um, and then just technology change in general, you know, we're just all becoming much more digital organizations, but that actually means we have to know how to work differently, um, how to collaborate differently, how to um, interact and communicate differently, how to share information differently, all that kind of stuff. Um, so all of that, of course, has been completely accelerated even more in the last two, three weeks. So, um, I'm excited to join this conversation and see if um, any of the things that we've been seeing in our work um, could be useful for everybody. Well, thank you, Maddie, for 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 joining us today. Uh, and uh, and and also, it's kind of fun to mix different people up. So, Mark, um, you know, you and I have known each other for a few years too. Why don't you tell the crowd about uh, about you know who you are and and why you're excited about addressing this topic today? Oh, Mark, you're on mute. It was, there was probably a reason I did that. I'm excited about. I was laughing. I was excited about draw, uh, addressing the topic of leadership in an age of COVID nineteen. Of COVID crisis, yeah. Like, no, I really. You're so you know, I've gone through. That. I've gone through my site and removed things. Like I used to say things like, "Mark loves infecting people with the uh, joy of fundraising." I take the infecting out, the contagious stuff out now, because that's just not right. Um, oh, and actually, just real, real funny that you mentioned that because even I was putting a deck together and my boss was like hey tim those uh those disco balls that you're using to represent an event look like covid <laughs> like in the way that they're they're grouped together and so it's like things are we just have so to fast. like think it's there's just so many things that we're having to reevaluate on the fly so sorry to interrupt mark why don't you tell no me that's fine so my name is mark pittman um i i'm an executive leadership coach and have a a specialty of uh coaching leaders in the fundraising context. So I've been doing fundraising with nonprofits, either as an employee or coaching them as fundraising coach originally, and then had more and more people say, but I need help in other areas, not just fundraising. And when, so they, my clients got me to be Concord Leadership Group because mostly leaders come with two minds and we, Concord is bringing them the two together into one. So it also sounds like it's from Massachusetts. That's not a bad thing, I'm from Maine. But um, this is, uh, a crazy time and it's also been a real privilege of a time to be have, being the go-to for people for the last for the last many weeks i started raising the covid 19 awareness with my clients in february just saying how are you going to do if, do your events differently what kind of contingencies are you putting in and it was at that point people even hospitals were saying it's not going to be a big deal mm. um <laughs> how quickly things change how quickly things have changed so yeah. So yeah, and 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 kind of the 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 goal of MPO's rise as a campaign is to just starting start putting immediately actionable resources in in organizations' hands. And so we're, we're going to start with kind of a big high level question, folks. In all honesty, um, in preparation for this, Mark and Maddie and I said, you know what? Like, let's not over engineer this. Let's organically unpack things. We basically only have two questions that we're going to address. Um, outright in terms of like a deck and I'm even going to like turn off the deck um, uh, so folks can see us I think that's important in this time in, in terms of making a connection with people so we're going to address first how should we think about organizational culture right now and then the other question is going to be how should we think about leadership right now and that's that's what we're going to get get into um, so I'm going to pop that sharing off. Should be seeing just me and Mark for now. Maybe Maddie's Maddie's internet's going to get in. better. She's hey, there she <laughs> is. Awesome. Um, so, so Maddie, because you're you're rejoining us visually, I'm gonna I'm gonna kick it over to you in terms of you know how should we be thinking about uh, uh, you know organizational culture in this moment? Yeah. So um, I think one of the things that's really important about culture is that it's all about um, 
how we interact with each other, right? And so in this super weird situation, um, I think it's a way to, to just remember that we, that we are connected as human beings. Um, so even though, for example, um, there's so much information out there about how to work remotely successfully, how to set up your home office, you know, what technologies you should use, like all of these kind of practical things. Um, culture is where you can really start to think about the human connection part. Um, and knowing that everybody on your team or uh, in your entire organization is probably really stressed out right now. And so, and also kind of missing just the daily interactions with people, no matter how small they used to be. So that's sort of the first step um, in my mind is really um, overemphasizing that human connection and just being able to really ask how people are doing. Um, and then beyond that, you'll start to get into how things are changing. So re related to your culture, you know, maybe normally you have a culture where people just come in and are, are head down and they just do their work, you know, and they work in, in teams, but they don't really interact um, or collaborate more widely. But in this new world, um, maybe we need to pay attention to how to actually um, collaborate differently because those connections can help us do our work better. Um, now that you can't just walk down the hall to somebody else's office. Mm -hmm. And Maddie, on that point, actually, in terms of asking how people are feeling, number one, how are you two feeling today? I'm, Nervous? Feeling, I'm feeling okay. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's um, it's hard because we're I think we're all kind of thrown into even more work than ever. Um, <laughs> I made a joke on Facebook the other day about free time, this mysterious thing that everybody keeps talking about that I have, I'm working just ridiculous numbers of hours. Um, but the work sort of helps you kind of not dwell on the scariness of the actual situation. Yeah. So it's sort of wavering back and forth. <laughs> and, and folks, uh, there is a chat. Uh, if you wanted to let, let us know uh, how you're feeling right now, you know, we would, you please yeah. love to yeah please let us know uh, we so did for me, actually, I'm in, oh yeah. go ahead Mark. i'm in enneagram seven so do either of you know the enneagram typology at all i'm a seven too oh yay so i don't know how <laughs> to do the feeling question because that's just like i don't whatever i'm not sure how i feel but um you know i signed a book deal uh the beginning of the week on the leadership book topic book so there was that but then i just learned that one of my uh most fun and enjoyable people to collaborate with sorry um is in icu because he's he had covid uh, mm -hmm. symptoms and there's not enough tests to go around despite what others are saying so it's just this weird time of uh, earlier this week i realized that i have been connecting with people on ha virtual happy hours and zoom calls and all this other stuff but the people in my home I was not connecting with. So I intended, mm. intentionally had lunch as in what Diane Leonard calls her employee kitchen, <laughs> her, the employee cafeteria, which is the kitchen, just to be physically around the people that I'm actually in the same space with. So it's a weird time. And I think, I think that's an important point in terms of maintaining culture because culture isn't like a monolithic thing that just ends when you walk out of the room, right? Like, yeah, right. like it, 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 especially strong culture is going to bleed throughout every facet yeah. of your organization, whether you're there or not. And um, that's what we're seeing right now, which is interesting to me. And I'm sure Maddie and you are seeing this too, that um, especially now that many of the organizations are in their second week, some are in their first, but mm -hmm. this is a great time for you leaders that are on the call to take a, take stock at what intentionally happened as you move to a work at home sort of scenario and what intentionally didn't because this is where the true values come to the core to come to the core yeah. like, like some right. leaders have a hard time the fundraisers know this well fundraisers are the ones that are making money when they're not in their seat and so the ceo doesn't know what to do with them because it's not a button seat scenario like everybody else they know basically they're doing their work because they're in their chair well now nobody's in their chair and they may actually be being more efficient because there's no more chit chat and water cooler conversation, but the culture could be plummeting because it's total isolation and it's just business when people interact because they feel like they have to have an excuse. So, so this here, is a really good time to, yeah, go ahead. Here's the things that, because we asked and I, and I, and we intentionally did this, that, that like when we put these webinars together, folks, we were, we were 
making sure like one, we're going to take away, you know, the phone number field. So people feel we're not going to just call them about our stuff. Right. Like, so just <laughs> know that like, this is, this is here to help you. And that's the only design of these types of webinars. And then um, we simply ask the question, how are you feeling? That's it. That's like the only custom question that we added on these. And, and so here's the responses that we got overwhelmed, brave, tired, and overwhelmed in the same response, anxious, concerned about the future. This is a good one, feeling good. This crisis has forced me to focus on developing our continuity plan, which is long overdue, um, better than I expected, and then good and good. So wide range of, of responses and emotions there. So when you folks hear that, what do you feel? What do you feel in terms of like, like what does that represent where we are right now? Yeah, my wife just left. I just love that because that's part yeah, of the that's gonna happen. She, is, the the, the, the children, folks. I have three kids. They're under five. They're five and twin two and a half year olds. So I don't think this is gonna be an outright BC, BBC situation, but do not be surprised if that happens. So go, Matt, so Maddie, we, how are people using tools? I've noticed there there's a leader in uh, Dubuque, I think Dubu Des Moines, who's they use Slack anyway, and so now they're doing uh, Cherry and Koshi. So he's doing hashtag morning coffee and having everybody take a pic, cup, uh, picture, picture of their coffee mug and send it in. Um, what are you seeing other tools that are people using to try to keep people connected in a more social way? Yeah, I think there's lots of different different ways, and some of them are um, just extensions of how people normally run, you know, team check-ins, for example. So one group I'm very embedded with, um, every Tuesday we have a team check-in at 9 a.m. So that's that's always been the case. That's not nothing new, but I think it's become so much more important now, and will continue to be. And maybe maybe we can do that. This happens to be on Skype. But we can do that with more groups, you know, as as things progress, because that connection from a culture perspective definitely becomes more and more important. And also asking the how are you feeling question at the beginning of every call is also really important. Just acknowledging that there's a wide range of of different feelings. And, you know, some people may be super anxious and stressed and maybe not feeling well physically, which is really stressful. And then other people may be, you know, raring to go at, at that particular moment. And so wow. you can, as a manager or, you know, host of the meeting or whatever, you can kind of take into account those, those varieties of feelings, which doesn't answer your technology question. <laughs> No, but that's really uh, but yeah, good. I think and I think, all the I think what you're pointing ones. to is that leaders don't need to necessarily have all the answers at a time like this, although we feel right. like we do. Um, it's holding the space because yeah. I, I, like you, have a 12 o'clock. I know at 12 o'clock there's a group of keynote speakers that are meeting, and one of them got, is getting a little irritated because we're not necessarily talking business. We're just hanging out. But it is so emotionally healthy to just be that way, but that's not the metrics that – we think of as leadership in our organization. So if you just had a hangout, people would be like, is this required? I've got kids here. And so trying to adjust for family life and still have that team space is important. That's really good. Well, so, and speaking so, of that, there's, there's also ways to do it online. So we have um, one, the same group has a big online community um, and we have a staff network inside the community, of course. Um, but having, and we normally do a monthly post, you know, what are you up to this, what's, what's top of mind this month, but that, that one for March has turned into a, how are you feeling thread, but it's not, mm -hmm. it's not at a particular time on video. It's just whenever somebody has, you know, the ability cool. or the thought to go in and answer the question, um, you know, that works really well. So we have somebody from the, the, uh, in the, um, uh, who joined the presentation today, they said, our library is connecting by using a weekly Zoom meeting, a continuous Facebook chat, mm. uh, email, texting, Facebook Live, and a virtual wow. world. Ooh, I want to know what a virtual world is. Is it like Minecraft? Did you like make the library or, or uh, but, but seriously, those are all really, really good uh, examples. I'm, I bet it's Second Life. I was second wondering life. about Second oh. Life. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Libraries are really, they were really, really into that. Yeah, it really? was a, a library. Yeah, back in the day. Oh wow! And it's just fascinating yeah. in terms of like all these different types of tools, um, you know, activating because we use Slack, we use Zoom, we use GoToMeeting for for these types of things too. Um, and on our Slack channel, for instance, in the morning we have a social chair, um, and she's taking charge of making sure that we have like one uh, channel on Slack, the communications kind of workplace tool, uh, if you're not aware. 
where it's just called random. And for like yeah. a year, it's just been like, oh, there's just so much noise in that thing. Like that's it's explicitly non work like discussions. That's like the purpose of the channel. And that's morphed into where everybody's going and they have a different topic and theme for posting there of the day. So yesterday they said, post a photo that has a pop of color. Like what colors are inspiring you? And then it was just everybody posting all oh, these. I things. love that. Um, yeah, it was really cool. It was really cool. Um, like what snacks are you eating? You know, like, like that was another one for another day. Um, and especially, you know, people, people have, uh, we had an all hands meeting for neon one yesterday to just kind of wow. share what, what are we doing? Not touching hands. Not ha No, no, it's all hands separated meeting. And, uh, and, but we talked about, we talked about a few key things. And I think from a leadership standpoint, what, what I learned here is our leader, uh, uh, CEO, Michael Farb, he did a few key things. He gave concrete updates in terms of what, um, is happening right now in the world. So we've looked at like what what is affecting nonprofits, right? And so there's economic data that we shared that that I helped supply. Um, uh, and and Chirian's uh, talk as well, I actually drew from that in terms of like saying, this is you know what happened before and what happened here. So that put people at, at a little bit of ease in terms of the context. Then we talked about what's happening at our organization itself. Um, what are we doing? What are clients experiencing? That type of stuff. And so nonprofits can be asking themselves the same questions. Yeah. What are what are our program participants experiencing? I've I've even had some people set up calls and they're like, how do I focus on donor retention if our programs aren't even happening right now? Right? Um, like why oh, why wow. would, why would somebody donate if we're not doing what we actually should be doing? Right? And in some cases, yeah. that is going to be the situation. A lot of theaters. Are, are, are running into that type of situation where they can't put on plays very easily, right? So, um, and then what was great is that we sh we showcased successes in terms of the shift to, to, to virtual. So we spotlighted six clients in terms of what they have done shifting to virtual. And it wasn't all fundraising. There was uh, the Minnesota Horticultural Society shifted to webinars for gardeners, mm. you know? Where they're doing that, uh -huh. and people can sign up and 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 say, you know what, I need to learn how to garden. I'm, how do I do that? And it's like, hey, go to go to Minnesota. They got it, you know. Um, and so that was very comforting to me because, from a leadership standpoint, it maintained the culture of like why we exist, which is to help nonprofits grow, uh, to 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 you know maximize their missions. Um, but then at the same time, it also like just gave us comfort in terms of they even said like. These are steps to make sure that we're we're financially solvent. We're not going to go out of business, right? Like they right. talked about, like like this is how you're going to continue to get paychecks, and like here's all the health well, resources. Some of the leaders on here aren't having those conversations. They're having to make really tough decisions about: do I furlough the employee or do I fire them? And and then do I employ you know exactly. sign them up for unemployment insurance? Uh, and so for I have some leaders in our community that are um, saying that furloughing is a way to. Uh, expedite resources, but also firing. If you have to let someone go, if you can sign them up for the unemployment insurance, it's faster for them than if they have to do right. it themselves. Um, yep. Questions that, I mean, there are issues that no no leader should have to do. So what I wanted to say, and I'm glad you're still on, Maddie, is um, the what, if, if, for leaders on the call, um, be sure that you're creating culture with other leaders as well. Mm -hmm. If you're just trying to do it with your team, you're going to quickly become uh, an empty cup, a uh, well that runs dry, because you, you're going to feel like you're inadequate for the job because nobody is a, adequate for this job. So as you're talking to other leaders, whether it's in the state association of nonprofits, uh, other leaders in your chamber of commerce, uh, in your own sector, other you know museum leaders or arts leaders, um, you can start just being with people that you can let your hair down with and have that same sort of, oh my goodness, I don't know what I'm doing conversation. That will help your culture with your organization and your team as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's so intertwined, right? I oh, think absolutely. That, that, that good yeah. leadership, good leadership comes from good culture and in turn, good culture is, is uh, facilitated by good leadership. Yes. I could probably hope yeah, so that. Well, so I'm just gonna put your picture up here, Maddie. Oh, you can just put <laughs> Maddie's picture for for the. Oh. Today. There she is. 
I'll 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 try and good culture, Mark. turn it back on. Yeah, I'll try and turn it back <laughs> on if it if my internet gets better. Um, but one of the things I wanted to dig into a little bit, um, yeah, and I'm in interested in your in the room. That's all right. <laughs> Um, and interested in your thoughts is around um, conflict. So when, you know, one of the big things that leaders have to manage is um, internal conflict um, among their teams or, you know, among individual people in the organization. And of course, this can be really accelerated when we're all remote and um, the yeah. speed of communicating is so much faster. And you just, Tim, you were just talking about these 800 different channels for people to talk about stuff, right? So one question is, which one do we choose? But that's a whole conversation in and of itself. Um, and I don't think we have any answers right now for that. But in the meantime, you're going to get miscommunications and just, you know, stress in general that leads to conflict potentially. So having leaders able to have comfort or a comfort level for managing kind of difficult conversations or spotting when things are kind of spiraling, mm -hmm. I think is even more important than it's always been um, at, in this time. Yeah. And by Did the way, it was Second Life. Oh. It was Second Life? It awesome. was Second Life. Yeah. I didn't know that still existed. <laughs> I tried that. I didn't walk very well. It was hard. <laughs> and I'd love to, and, and, and for the leaders on the call and, and things of that nature, continue to, to share, you know, what you're doing to address and, and, and you know, ask us questions too. This is this is a conversation. We're, we're a resource for you in terms of, of, it could be as simple as like, I don't, you know, I, I don't know where to start. Um, and maybe that's a good question, actually, which is like, if so, some, some organizations, they just have like what the person even said, like, addressing the continuity plan because it's long overdue. There's a lot of these situations where there's always the project that really could have helped right now <laughs> that right. they didn't get yeah. to. So, so well, on in, the continuity issue, so there, I was on the Chamber of Commerce had a webinar today on cybersecurity because with yeah. all the people working from home, um, there could be added vulnerabilities. Sorry to add yet another stress to listeners, but there could be added vulnerabilities with uh, hackers getting into your nonprofit network because uh, through these other more porous things but the continuity question came up and he said look at who you, look at who if you're an ascent if you're deemed essential services which um i happen to think most of the nonprofit sector is um but or we need the arts to get through this we need museums to be around when we're done even to help us get through it now uh, theater is obviously we need places where we can express emotions that we may not be able to express ourselves and challenge our assumptions. So I think it's all essential. But um, he said, if you have an essential office where people are still working, you've already started your continuity plan. You've already made some decisions about who who needs to who's essential for continuing the work. And so look back at your last week or two and just see what what are the patterns that have happened. And you might have a continuity plan if you hadn't had one there, um, which is really helpful. I keep looking at Maddie like, yeah, I can see you because you're in my room now. <laughs> you're in the office. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. he's holding up your photo in the... In I know. The... I know. I can, yeah, I can actually see. Oh, that's funny. Okay. I wish I had a little yeah. tripod because the circulation of my arm. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. You don't have to do that. <laughs> oh, I but do. I appreciate it. <laughs> it makes it better. Thank you. <laughs> so this so this is top of mind for me because cause even in the, in the background, you know, uh, I hear... Uh, my children, right? And, uh, and, and I'm working, you know, with my wife here too, and, and things of that nature. So uh, what can we do to quickly address the, the interpersonal factors that our employees, uh, our program participants, whoever might be dealing with at home, right? Like one of the things that I read about that, that started to concern me, and it's obvious when you think about it, but is uh, people from domestic violence organizations are saying like, this yeah. is a very, very bad time for people who've, who've been abused right now because they're stuck inside with their abuser. Um, and, and so there's a lot of, of interpersonal elements that need to be taken into account. What is a good thing that somebody can do to support their employees if, if it doesn't have to be that extreme, but there's going to be hardships that people go through? What can we do? to address that in an effective way. Give me your shot, Maddie. Okay. <laughs> I was gonna see if you if you wanted to start on that one. Oh, um, so it's such an think, easy question that has a simple answer. 
<laughs> I do think um, on on one level there are a lot of resources being shared right now um, for a lot of different things. Um, obviously, coronavirus related specifically, but just in general, I think people are organizations are are very um, good at sharing what resources they they have or have heard of. Um, or even just people in general, you know, sharing resources with each other. Um, so, so as leaders, we could be uh, paying attention to those kinds of things that are relevant to our organization and making, you know, a, a list, a repository, a Google Doc, whatever it is that that has those resources listed and that is collaborative, so people can add to that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm I'm always going to go back to the the being a listening ear, right? Like just having um, the ability for employees to share what they need with you as as the leader, the manager, the CEO, um, the executive director, you know, um, because what's interesting is that there are many, many, many organizations where you would never normally really share any of this kind of stuff with them because you were able to completely separate home and work, right? But now you can't. So... So even if that was never like you, you as a manager never really talked about um, personal stuff with your team before, um, making it known that you're that you're willing and happy to, I think is just really really critical. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not it's not a a Michael Scott situation where your employees are your friends type thing necessarily. I think that there's going to be still some some lines that are going to just be hard to give up um, uh, or, or maybe should still be there. Um, but yeah, I think just being a little bit more understanding of like, just we just need more empathy when you get down right. to it. It's just a lot right. more empathy. And uh, one thing I want to share, sorry, Mark, oh, cool. I just want to share, share this real quick. Yeah. It, it, it is in the deck for download, but we've created, uh, curated a few key resources from uh, from uh, you know, around the partner network, uh, but specifically from both Maddie and Mark. There's two two resources each from them. And then please check out the overall NPO's Rise campaign itself, because there's a ton of of stuff there that we've curated specific to the economics here, uh, moving virtually. Um, Beth Cantor's master resource uh, that she's put together that has like, if you can think of it and it relates to nonprofits, it's there, you know? So yeah, oh, it's massive, it's massive. So you can download this handout, go straight to the the page or neon1.com slash MPO's rise. But these are the things that when I said, Maddie, Mark, can you send me some stuff that pertains to leadership? Uh, these are the ones that they have. So check it out. But we're, we're we, you know, we still got some time. Just want to share that. So, at this well, point. What, one of the things that I wanted to say about that is, is recognizing that people process stress differently. Moving to home and remote settings is stressful anyway, without the fear of being an invisible biological weapon that could infect somebody else. Um, yeah. And, that has a whole nother level of complexity. So um, in one of those resources, the uh, you know, and Maddie and I already talked about the Enneagram. There's um, one of the ways that Enneagram teachers use is something from a uh, neo-Freudian uh, psychologist, Karen Horney, who talked about different stances and instinctual drives. And there are three, pri- three instinctual drives. One's aggressive, one's withdrawn, and one's dependent. And so some of your employees may be, uh, you may be the aggressive person who's always thinking of the future and the problem is always something to be conquered and it takes action to do that. And you see other people that are just kind of paralyzed. You know, there's free, free what is it? Fight, flight, or freeze. Um, so there, you might be the fighter and there may be someone who's frozen but it's not really that they're frozen. They're actually trying to process internally because they're trying to come up with their own polished answers that are perfect and unassailable before they share them. And they need some space, not too much. If you're in that space, you do need to get out to. But then there's the other part, the third one, the dependence or compliance that are always trying to see the, some, somebody has the answer. And so I have to just keep doing all the webinars and doing all the blog posts and doing everything I can to keep in touch with uh, everybody, because somebody else has that. And um, each of those three ways of dealing with stress are fine, and, and we need them, because we do need each other, we do need to take action, and we do need to reflect. But uh, it can be really frustrating when everybody else seems to not get it. They act weird, and then we don't realize we're the ones that are possibly acting weird, too. I think 
also one of the things that we can do just on an everyday basis when it relates to that is like that's kind of we were seeing a bunch of posts and, and discussions about like the, the perfection of Instagram, right? Like people on Instagram and their lives look so amazing and stuff like that. And, and, and the reality is, is that like, I know a bunch of parents and they're posting, you know, nice things that their kids are doing. I do it too. But the reality is, is that like just five minutes ago, the kids were screaming and fighting with each other and my wife has to go help them. Right. And I'm sitting there feeling like, feeling like I, I, I want to help oh, everybody yeah. here, but I also want to help them too. And it's not, we're just not going to be able to balance it all right now. It's just, that's the reality. Things are going to get dropped. Um, and so if we understand that and just not put so much pressure on ourselves that, well, I saw that, that, you know, this person I went to high school, like spun up an entire amazing, like homeschool structure for her family <laughs> for the entire week. And, and, and she, you know, is friends with, you know, uh, Yo Yo Ma, and he's doing personal concerts for, for <laughs> the kids, like as one does. Everybody, yeah. I always think back to that that photo of um, uh, uh, why am I blanking on her name? But it's one of the the uh, it's one of the royals, right? Um, not not Megan, but why am I blanking? I don't what Kate Kate Middleton. Thank you. See, thank you for the win. For the win. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Kate Middleton but her flipping out on her kid, right? There's like a photo where she's like, oh, like, really? You little, you little, uh, like, it makes me go, human. it happens to everybody, yeah. you know? And even if you don't have kids, like a friend of mine texted me and he's like, he's he was actually one of the Neon One consultants and he texted me, and this is funny enough that I'm going to read it, um, but he wrote, um, saw your tweet, just sending virtual high five, brother, we got this. I yelled at the dog yesterday for taking too long to crap in the backyard. That's where we're at. <laughs> Everybody's stressed. And so so it's not going to be perfect. And and I think, you know, um, one of the big questions that maybe I have for you folks is how do you prioritize in, a, in, a, mm -hmm. in an environment like this? How do leaders prioritize their projects for their staff? And then how do they prioritize their own work? What would you what would you say to that? Well, I was actually I'm gonna... asking easy questions. I'm asking easy questions today. Yeah, no, and I was, I was actually going to come at it from a different angle but it's actually exactly the same question which is around basically trust and accountability right which every leader um, cares about so from an accountability perspective you know maybe maybe you're the kind of leader that that is very um, deadline oriented you know has a specific process for how you want people to submit their work or you need to review everything you know whatever the case may be maybe what you need to do as a leader is is shift that regular process so that mm. you can allow people to work differently, maybe at a different pace, maybe different times of the day, you know, whatever it is, but still get you the results that you need just to keep the wheels turning, because that's what all what we're all trying to do. Mm -hmm. You know, but but that's a that's a question of trust. And if you didn't really trust your team members before, well you need to now <laughs> because yeah. Yeah. you know this is this is the way of, of the world, at least for a while. So you can't be worrying about, you know, whether people are sitting at their desks from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Because basically they're not. Like, they probably don't have a desk not. at all. Yeah, they may have a couch. <laughs> right. They may have a kitchen table. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like the yeah. answer is no. <laughs> you well, know, but it, that doesn't it, mean that they're not doing want, really think, good work. Oh, sorry. Um, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so that is, I love that. And I think part of it is that and knowing that it's it's helpful to hold people to accountability of some generous sort. So I noticed that uh, there's a lot of leaders that are really well and well-meaning and incredibly poorly informed because they're thinking, oh, now's not the time to be asking people for money. And at the time of this recording, it's the 27th of March. We're in the second week for a lot of us of this lockdown, unless it's in, you know, depending on where you are. People are very generous. And I just got another email today. Somebody else just raised $10,000 in two, two hours from an email that Steven Screen put out. And maybe we can put that in the resources too. Um, mm -hmm. If you, yeah, over at uh, Workless Raise More, he has a eight point outline. Um, and the, um, the people want something to do. And so your employees do too. And so helping them get out of that fog of it's just all overwhelming 
could be having some bite-sized chunks of things to do and saying, hey, we really do need to get this done. But it's not because I need you to. It's because you have to, this is where the whole cultural part comes back in. You have to have the values. You have to know what your core values are, what the nonprofit's core values are, and what the nonprofit's fight is. If you're fighting for whatever, then you can rise higher than yourself. So what's what's going to, in the, uh, the leadership studies that we've done, we looked at servant leaders, transformational leaders, transactional leaders, and charismatic leaders. And I think charismatic leaders rally around themselves. So they're going to have a hard time here because they're not physically present with people. So they're going to want to just be dominating people's time and not letting them do work. Transactional people are going to be the more card punching ones of do your job and get it done. And I don't want any chit chat. Um, the transformational and servant leaders are going to be the ones that have a better chance of it because they're going to be talking about the vision and the mission and making sure people have the resources they need in the new context to do that. Uh, so I think this is going to be a great shift where you're going to, if you're not any of those, you don't think, try transformational. Think of the mission. Think of the vision. What are your core things? What's the fight you're in there for? And make the main thing the main thing and let a lot of the other things just kind of lay fallow for right now because you may not be able to do them. That's okay. I love I love that, and it actually syncs up very well with with <laughs> we have uh, Sonia who keep rocking it. Sonia, love love these. She wrote for us: our users and patrons needs come first, and we could prioritize okay. engagement tasks and projects with that in mind. The mission, our mission, is applicable still. Well, and Kristen Bennett, I think it was, or Samantha Swain, we did a um, a webinar with them yesterday in the nonprofit academy, and they said our donors were there for us all these years. It's our turn to be there for our donors. So checking in with them and just saying, how are you? And be careful because sometimes that can be like, after, if anybody's had here has been, uh, had, had a close one die, you know that when people say, what can I do? There's nothing you can do. They're not, mom's not coming back. Um, that was my experience with my mother. It was just sort of like, I don't, you just laid a burden on me because I don't have a question I can answer. So you're not doing that. But you're saying, these are trying times. How are you? We are so support. We were so glad that you've been here for us. How can we, you know, it, we, one of the nonprofits was saying do you, to their older donors, do you, do you have groceries? Would you like us to go get some, get them for you and just leave them on your doorstep? I mean, that's just, it's really yeah. we get front line with people's generosity and helping. It's great. Well, and for us, we, we work with a lot of, um, we work with a lot of associations. And so, you know, they're, everybody's membership is, just as stressed and worrying about you know their own work and their own um, organizations and jobs and um, just universities and you know all the things that everybody does and so as as an association you can be the center of gravity that helps in whatever way you can to to keep people connected to each other and it's sort of like we're all in the same boat but we can help each other. Um, in a whole variety of ways, if we if we only stay connected. Hmm. That's good. And and yeah, it's just it's just I think understanding that that oh, and I'm going to bring a little bit of data that we've seen right now. Um, specifically, let's talk about about giving, right? Because some some organizations and Mark and I, uh, we were on a virtual happy hour yesterday, and and kind of made fun of the fact that like. Uh, there's a lot of frustrated consultants, for instance, that are like, "Why are you, why is your board telling you not to ask people for money right now?" This is and it's not because we're manipulative or con artists. It's because yeah. there will be a, a decrease in giving at some point, and we've yeah. seen from previous recessions, even though this is completely different, previous recessions still are an indicator that people are generous up front, and then the cash flow dries up even more, and the yes. nonprofits that try to get it later have the hardest time. So why would you put yourself in a bad situation when people aren't listening anymore? That's There's so, a go, sorry Tim, go ahead. Exactly. I'm passionate about this. Oh. No, no, no. And, and we're <laughs> on the same page. So the, the reality that that we're seeing internally across the board is that that while there are some hits when it comes to some of the in-person events being canceled, a lot of those organizations that are making the shift from from a, to a virtual event are maintaining the cash flow there. And then in general um, we're seeing large spikes in online donations across the board. Um, there's been some things in the arts and theater world that, where there's obviously some struggles with physical tickets. That's where the majority yeah. of their revenue comes as opposed to like a subscription membership or something like that. But organizations that uh, so we have a lot of giving days, right? We do the giving days for, for North Texas. We do uh, Arizona's coming up in, in April. And, and their numbers are like, are almost already exceeding where they were last year, you know, mm -hmm. at, at this, at, at, in the overall campaign. Um, uh, they haven't even had the day yet. 
in a lot of ways. Oh, wow. So, so yeah, things are things are looking very very positive there in terms of of organizational adoption, um, in terms of 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 uh, people who are pledging early uh, as well. So so giving's going up. And I was actually on the on the steering committee call for the fundraising effectiveness project, and that includes Blue Meringue, that includes Donor Perfect, and they reported the same exact thing in that call okay. today. So so uh, this is not a neon one uh, item. This is an industry item in terms of 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 this is a a time where people are feeling they want to help and they don't they don't necessarily know how to help. And and if you you ask correctly, because there's don't be Ole Miss. And basically, Mark, do you want to? Do, do you, Maddie, well, do you I don't. Know I didn't the appeal, thing, but they did a no. appeal uh, uh, this week. I think it was the beginning of this week or the end of last week, and it came across sort of like, since it's a pandemic, you're probably going to die soon. So would you leave us in your will? <laughs> That's oh, kind of that's the that's a little tone deaf. That's a little that's very inappropriate. But um, if if you are afraid that donors don't won't give and you don't ask them they won't give. It becomes a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's where it can be very helpful to be looking at uh, data, like like Tim's talking about. I'm a fan of data and intuition. Um, and the thing you'll see in the Steven Screen video is he ke says, keep asking until the data shows that they stop giving. And then reshift. But if we do our fundraising based on our feelings, um, that that is not a good recipe for keeping the cash flow going. And one last thing before I let I'll stop and let Maddie talk to you is that um, if your board is telling you not to fundraise at this time, thank them and then ignore them because it's not their decision. They hire the CEO. The CEO is responsible for the day-to-day -day stuff. They do not dictate how the operations happen. I, and I, I'll just I'll leave it there. Sorry, I'm, I'm starting to preach. <laughs> Well, just to, to expand it beyond fundraising too, I think if there's if there's any silver lining in all of this, it's that we're starting to think really creatively about how to provide value to our stakeholders, whether they're nice. donors or members or uh, students or you know whatever segment um, it is. Just because you can't do the the programs and services that you normally used to do doesn't mean you can't come up with some other cool stuff you know um and so it's you know like i mentioned at the top of the hour just it's it's accelerating things that maybe we were all thinking about um just more slowly before like like putting more of our programs online you know that's something i'm sure pretty much everybody has been thinking about or is already doing but all of a sudden it's like how do we put everything online <laughs> You know, but there's there's an ability and just something I really love about human beings in general is just the ability to be creative and to really when you're when you're constrained is when that kind of innovation stuff happens the most because it's like we're stuck in this situation, but we've got to figure out some way to keep the wheels turning, but also maybe we'll come up with some amazing new ideas that we would never have thought of if it was just day to day. Have you seen the symphonies that are doing their Zoom all from their their physical isolation places, but they're all trying to get together as a symphony and play? I mean, yeah. there's all sorts of stuff. I haven't if, seen that. Wow. Uh, uh, and so you yeah, said North they're Texas. They're amazing. in the one o'clock lab band at uh, University of North Texas. And they're doing, they're taking the time since they can't perform to do vignettes and they're introducing each of their band members on Instagram um, and they're, with their instrument. Um, so they're trying to do things to, remain relevant and connect with their with the people that will buy the tickets later uh but we're also you're seeing this tim and maddie too i'm sure sponsors are getting actually great value for their what would have been an event yeah. sponsorship they're now getting mm -hmm. to have um the, for the nonprofits that are thinking creatively the digital reach is so much further than the physical show, showing up at the physical place and can be more relevant too even if it's a local uh retailer that so there are some really creative ways that we're we're coming up with to to provide value for people and retain sponsorships as well. So. I think that's that's an important point too, because uh, uh, if we look at the broader economic environment, there's a lot of businesses that are feeling feeling the crunch right now, and and I think it's important to think um, about your relationships with your your 
corporate sponsors in particular, the people who, who make your work, uh, you know, happen when it comes to events and things like that. And, and just be empathetic about that and be open and creative. Um, you know, on the neon one side, for instance, we've had discussions with, with folks where it's like, Oh, okay. That's, that's kind of cool. And then others are just like, nah, this is, you're just not, we're not going to do anything. You will throw you on like social media. That's it. Right. And it's like, yeah, you don't want to hear that. You want to hear that you're being treated, um, you know, as continued that we're still a sponsor, (laughs) you know, that the relationship still matters and that, that, um, you're not just going to walk away and keep the money, you know, in some situations. And it's like, you don't want to do that. And so maintaining the relationship and reach out to your major donors, reach out to your corporate sponsors who've supported you in the past, reach out to just leadership. Again, if it doesn't even necessarily have to be money, it's just like whoever's creating value for your organization, they want to hear from you right now. They do. Well, I've just reached out. I don't know if you guys are doing this, but I know nonprofits are too, are reaching out to people in their community that aren't necessarily sponsors or, or mm-hmm. staff, but just saying, we are so grateful that you're in the community. You've created a place that we get to operate in. What can we do to help you? Aww. Yay. Oh, are we going to get, are we going to, so, well, we're coming near the end. So this is two out of the three children right here. So, um, but uh, yeah, girls, do you have anything to add about leadership in a time of crisis? Did you guys do some baking today? We're going to, we're going to do some baking after this, right? Oh, after. Good. Okay. Yeah. We're going to make it. Well, today's theme is, is, well, it's been fairy tale theme. At the San Antonio house. Oh, very nice. And, and today we did uh, <laughs> uh, the gingerbread man, you know, story where it's like, nah, 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 you can't get me on the gingerbread man. And so we made, we're going to make gingerbread man cookies after this, right? Not the gumdrop buttons. I always go Shrek when you say ginger hey, man. Hey, <laughs> gingerbread go, man. go get a snack. Go get a snack, daddy. Daddy's got to earn the big bucks. <laughs> okay. Love you. Um, no, and, and that's, that's the thing that like, um, it's just maintaining that that closeness, right? Like that, I even texted my wife during this. I'm like, send one of the kids over. Like it's okay, you know. Like people get it, and, yeah. and that's, that's going to be across the board. Your your corporate sponsors, the CEO. My CEO took a call from his closet. He's got twins, right? Like <laughs> things got to keep happening. He's like, it was a great call, like really good call, you know. The sound dampening is really good. There's no echoing when you're in your closet. He yeah. did. He said the acoustics were yeah. great, actually. That yes, was they the are. <laughs> Speaking from experience. Yeah, every, everybody I know has dogs barking in the background or cats walking across their laptop screen. <laughs> so is there any any final thoughts that we want to share with folks as, as we kind of hit the top of the hour for today? For me, it would be, I just put another thing, if you could push it out to everybody else too, the nonprofitacademy.com slash trainings slash no dash the dash brain. Um, Jessica Sharp is a brain specialist and we've taken the paywall down on the nonprofit academy training for people. It talks about what stress is doing to your employees' brains and yours also. The the uh, cortisol that is is saturating your brain is helping you focus, but in it's going too far right now and it's causing you to not see opportunities that exist like Maddie was talking about with the value added things. So um, even if it's not your character, I would encourage you to try to find some way of taking time of stillness, um, whether it's thinking of a river or doing some sort of meditative practice um, and feel free, uh, you know, tweet me, Mark A. Pittman, email me, whatever, uh, be, to find out about this because I know this isn't natural for our culture. <laughs> But it is uh, the brain science is really clear that this is what's going to help us get through it as leaders and help us to not miss out on opportunities that are around us because we're just so focused and, and afraid, understandably afraid. So mm-hmm. take some time to to have that time by yourself in stillness. How about yeah, you, I, I agree. I agree 100 percent on that um, for sure. Um, so for me, it's actually similar. So. Um, we we also have a link um, in the resources to um, training online training for CEOs specifically around culture. Um, there's one about generational differences, um, and there's one specifically about conflict. So if anybody is uh, not that feels like they're not super au fait with how how you actually manage some of these things, um, but I think the point. My point really is ultimately about being intentional about it. So every leader, whether you're leading an organization or a team or a department, um, 
or yourself, um, just think about some of these underlying um, motivations and, and um, connections and, and ways of communicating. Um, because just like Mark said, you know, having more intentional ability to, to pay attention to those things will make all of us um, work much, much better and get through this. Because I know we're going to get through this. I don't I know about that. you guys, but I feel like it's better to assume you hired them. So better to assume the best intent. Like they really do want to do their job, yeah. even if it seems really dumb what they just did. Uh, but leading from a point of, wow, they must really want this hard. And I help me understand this. I don't get it. And that listening year that you said, Maddie. Yeah. Well, and also I just want to add leadership from, from the bottom, so to speak. So, you know, cool. if, if you're a junior level person, but you have a great idea, you know, like, don't be shy, you know, share it with, with everybody because, because we all need to think more creatively at, right now about how, we, how to do our work. I saw a large for-profit tech company. They put out a, a uh, kind of promotion, not a promotion thing. But it was like, this is what we're doing to give back to, to the community. But they explicitly cited in, and it was the, from the CEO, but they said, we explicitly got this idea sourced from from one of our entry level employees. Like, nice. like, and they're like they employ like twenty eight hundred people. Like, they talked about how large their workforce was and and where this person came from in terms of the idea. And I and that resonated with me because there's going to be a yeah. lot of people who are on the ground that that leaders don't always know the day to day reality of of what's happened to our program participants or what donors are responding to or all the all the different facets of running a nonprofit. Um, you know, it could be the data entry person, right? We were we were talking about the impact of there's a lot of large caging firms out there that do checks that are weeks backed up, right? And so we have to be creative and that can come from anywhere. And if you don't foster a culture where anybody can have a good idea, then you're gonna get hurt right now. And now's the time to practice, just like Matt was saying, this is, there's a lot of flexibility right. in people's expectations. So yeah, not yeah. Forgive. Well, yeah. this was great. This was great folks. Um, you know, it, it may be, if we have any other final statements or questions from, from our attendees, you know, we can definitely dive into that. We got about another minute. Um, you know, but uh, otherwise, please download the handouts, uh, go to neonone.com slash NPOs rise. We have a ton of resources and we're actually going to be organically responding to what's happening and, and adding to that. There's some really interesting conversations that we've had with, with national and international uh, partners of ours that, that we want to, you know, update once those things are ready. So definitely continue to check out that campaign. But we're gonna get this recording up um, and uh, and the handouts and all that type of stuff into, into your hands, folks. Wanna thank all of you. We're gonna do this. We're gonna get through it. Let, we yes. do have a final comment. Hardy, thanks. I learned something from everyone. Awesome, thank you, Sonia. Uh, okay. we well, yeah, thank you. you. We learned about Second Life. We learned about all the great things <laughs> the library's doing. So very cool. All right. Thank you very much, thank folks. Thank you for bringing us together, for sure. Yeah, thank it's a you. Great, that's great that's the Neon One ecosystem right now. That's that's what it is. That's what it's all about. So, feeling the love. Feeling the love. Oh, all right. Fun. And I'll see all of you. And and uh, you know, keep, keep it up. Keep it up, folks. We could do this. I'm gonna go make some cookies now. <laughs> bye. Okay. Bye. <laughs>